it seems that we are starting from a certain level, right? It seems that we have a certain kind of uh, purity level that when we do meditation, you know, that's where we're coming from. And some people are really pure and holy and sweet and perfect and ready for it, and the rest of us aren't. <laughs> and so this is what we might call the set point. I don't know if you know in psychology there's this term called the set point. And the set point is, uh, it was from research in 1978. And this research was researching to happiness. You might think that uh, psychologists are only concerned with whether your mother hugged you when you were young, but a lot of psychological research is concerned with happy. What is it that makes you joyous, not what is it that makes you unhappy? And this particular research in 1978 separated people into three groups. People who had won the lottery, people who had had a spinal injury, and a control group of people who were just carrying on as normal. And what the researchers were looking at was the level of happiness of these three groups of people. Now, you would assume that the lottery winners were happier, right? Not really. It turns out they weren't. It turns out that pretty much it doesn't matter what happens to you. Of course, for a week or two, you're going to be very happy. The same as if you've had the accident or some kind of injury. For a, for a short while, you're going to be unhappy. But very quickly, you return to a certain level, a certain what they call a set point. And this seems to be your level of happiness. And you'll have good days and you'll have bad days, but you're pretty much going to average out at this particular level. Uh, since then, the, the, as all things with psychology, there's been the doubters and the people say it doesn't work. But um, it's been applied to a number of things. Happiness is one of them. Weight is another one. The, the principle is applied to weight, that you tend to have a certain weight, and you can f fast a little bit or you can diet. And you can probably drop a few pounds, maybe a couple of kilos, but then you're going to bounce back up to where you were before. And again, you can get you know a little bit overweight, Christmas or whatever it is, but hopefully pretty soon you're going to come back to the level you were at before. And the idea with the weight loss then is that you have to try to get your weight down underneath your set level and hold it for a couple of months. And then you've moved your set point to a new level. Hasn't worked for me so far. Uh, still working on that one. I got my set, set point down to 73 kilos. And then Pizza Hut had two for the price of one. And it went back, <laughs> went back up again. So there are different applications of this set point. But I think it's true for us in terms of meditation and our spiritual lives also that we have a certain level. You know, most of you in this room are not going to kill anybody. Most of you are not going to rob a bank. You may cheat a little on your taxes. Uh, you're not entirely pure and, and holy, but you're not going to steal money from a bank. You have a set level of morality, you have a set level of purity, uh, a set point. And if you come to a monastery or if you're doing the practices and meditation, maybe you'll rise to your upper bandwidth a little bit. Maybe if you're having a really hard time or going through a divorce or something, you will, will come down to your slightly lower level. But basically, you're going to be at around the same level. The same happens for things like moods. When you have a certain mood, in the short term, your mood can go up or down. But when you're in a mood, that's your new set point, and you're going to stay in that mood. So we seem to have this set point, and you know, in our hearts as a general lifetime, our spiritual level seems to be at a set point. So what happens is you come to do meditation. Maybe you go and see an inspiring teacher. Maybe you go and see Ajahn Jayasaro, and then you're at the upper level of your set point, and you think, wow, if I could just be with Ajahn Jayasaro for a whole week, then I'd be like way up there. And you wouldn't. You'd still be at this upper bandwidth, upper level of your bandwidth. You, know, you can get inspired you can be in the right position, you can read a good book, you can go and see the Dalai Lama. But your set point is going to be pretty much set. The work of moving that set point then is the harder work. 
when you come to do the meditation and you're in a nice environment and it's all going well, that's fine. But quickly you get used to it, you get bored with it. And then it's like your meditation drops down again. And you're like, oh, I have to go and change my teacher. I have to turn on the air conditioning. I have to do something. I have to buy a new sitting cushion. This is one of the funny things that people get into meditation and they get all into like what kind of sitting mat and what kind of sitting cushion that they have. I don't know if you've seen them, there's some for sale in Bangkok. They're about 4,000 baht for a set. People are like, oh, do it now. If I just get my 4,000 baht mat, then I'll really be able to meditate. <laughs> and it doesn't. You have a set point. You have a level that, that you're going to be at. And you can go up a little bit and you can have bad days. But you're going to be pretty much at that norm. So the trick is then to try to raise yourself above that. This may go right the way back to your childhood. I don't know if you've seen the marshmallow tests. Have you seen this on YouTube? Find anything on YouTube. The marshmallow test, uh, all psychologists here will have seen it. And this is a very simple test. They get a young child, somewhere between three years and ten years old, and they put him in a room, him or her, in a room with a table, a chair, and a marshmallow. That's it. A marshmallow, if you don't know, is a kind of soft candy. There's nobody on this planet that doesn't like a marshmallow. And they say to the child, you can eat that marshmallow if you like. Or you can wait, and when I come back, I'll give you two marshmallows. And then they leave, and the camera films what happens to the child. <laughs> this was done to actually show Freudian psychology. That is, Freud said that you are not a single unit you are a mass of warring drives. You have a sex drive, you have an altruistic drive, you have ideals, you have your rationality, you have your desire. You even have a nirvana drive, he said, this desire to, to die, to cease. And he said the human being is a, is a mass of these warring factions. So this test was devised to show the id, which is the part of your consciousness that is ruled by liking and disliking. And the ego, which is a rational part of your consciousness. So the child knows that it wants to eat that marshmallow. But the rational mind of the child knows that it's better off if it doesn't eat that marshmallow yet. So what does the child do? What do you think the child does? Do they eat the marshmallow or not? They lick it, they look at it, they sniff it, they put it in their mouth and then they pull it out again, they stuff it in their ear, they shove it out of sight, they squish it on the table, they do all kinds of things, it's quite amusing. Uh, look up the marshmallow test, and the, there's hundreds of variations on this. The very interesting thing about this test is, it was also testing what they call impulse control. And impulse control, even for three-year-olds, is a very strong determiner, determining factor of how you're going to live your life, whether you're going to succeed at school, whether you're going to succeed in a job world, and whether you're going to succeed in a marriage, even. Because those people that can control their impulses, have a strong ego, are the people that can study, the people that can work, the people that can be faithful. And the people that, even from a very young age, that couldn't control their impulses, later on in their life, they're going to be people that have more likely, more tendency to be a criminal more tendency to be in a lower paid job, more tendency towards divorce, and a whole range of other factors that are influenced by impulse control. So it's possible, it's an interesting idea, it's possible that even at a young age, our character is fairly well set in stone. There was another piece of research that took three month old babies, and this one woman, she determined whether you will grow up to be an introvert or an extrovert, and she can tell from a three-month-old baby. Very interesting, right? That your character is set from such an early age. Yeah. Which raises the question, is your character coming from a previous lifetime? Are you actually born with a blank state character? Or are you actually born with a whole load of baggage that you're going to have to work through? And the way she tested whether you're introvert or extrovert, introvert means that you like to be quiet, you find social interaction stressful, sitting on stages talking to people stressful, 
or an extrovert is someone who loves the interaction, loves a bit of stress, loves to take contact sports, this kind of thing. Uh, I myself am an introvert. It doesn't mean that you're shy. It just means that you like to be quiet and a little bit withdrawn. You need space and time for yourself. And the way that she tested this was making a loud bang next to these babies. And some babies would react to the bang and start crying and be shocked or get interested. And some babies would not react to the bang. Which ones were the introverts and which ones were the extroverts? So the babies that reacted to the bang, were they the introverts or the extroverts? Raise your hand if you think they're introverts. Raise your hand if you think they're extroverts. Interesting, yeah? So the babies that reacted to the loud bang were, when they grew up to be adults, introverts. <laughs> and her theory, which was borne out by the testing, showed that part of the reason that you're an introvert is you are overstimulated by your senses. If your senses are hardwired directly into your brain so that you're easy to stimulate, you will be somebody who likes to withdraw from stimulation and someone who likes to be quiet. If you are someone who's hard to stimulate, you'll be someone who goes out and looks for excitement and looks for those kind of situations. So, obviously, it was quite tough for her to prove this because she has to wait 20 years to find that. <laughs> so this research is just coming online now, now that it's been going for about 25 years, that is starting to show that she actually was correct in her hypothesis uh, 25 years ago. Same true for heart rate. If you have a low heart rate, you're more likely to be a criminal. Interesting. Huh? It's not a causal effect. It doesn't mean if you have a low heart rate, it will make you a criminal. But it means you are more likely to be. And there's an interesting book called Anatomy of Violence, which talks about this and shows that violent or criminal behaviors has a very strong basis in your physiology uh, and your gene, your gene expression and not just in the society and in the situation that you were brought up in. His view is that if you can treat the physical causes of it, very often you can stop the person from be de developing into a criminal. So all these things start to show that you probably do have a set point. Your character is not set in stone, but it probably has a certain level that's going to last with you through your lifetime. So to change that is going to take some consistent practice. There was a similar theory in Buddhism and that was the Santana. In Thai it's called the Sandan. And in Thai Sandan is always something that's negative. If you say something you and I Laksana you and I Sandan, you know, a character that's deep in your Sandan, usually it means something negative, like you're a nasty person. But the Sandana was the original jitter that you're born with. When you're born, your mind forms in a certain state or with certain proclivities or, or propensities and that through your lifetime that will be your personality and to change that according to Buddhism is very difficult. Of course this comes from a previous life rather than from whether you're hyper stimulated or not. Uh, the Buddha gave a similar story and he told, uh, he, he mentioned about this king who wanted to make a chariot and to make the chariot, he needed two wheels. So he went to the wheelwright and he asked for two wheels to be made. How long? The wheelwright, who was the best in the kingdom, said, six months. Fine. Made the order. The king comes back in six months and he finds that one wheel has been made and the other wheel hasn't. So we can learn from this that nothing really changes, does it? Uh, <laughs> And he, he says, why, why did you not make the second wheel? And the wheelwright said, I'm getting to it. He says, how long to finish the second wheel? The rest of my chariot is ready. The wheelwright said, well, it can take six days or it can take six months. So the king said, well, do it in six days. So six days later, the king comes back and the two wheels are there, finished, made, absolutely identical. No difference between them. And the king's a bit annoyed. He said, now come on, why did it take you six months? You could have done both wheels. In one wheel takes you six days. You could have done them both in 12 days. And I could be riding around in my chariot enjoying myself. 
And the wheelwright said, these wheels are not the same. They may look the same, but they're not. And he took the wheel that had taken six days to make and he rolled it down the street. As the wheel ran out of energy, it wobbled to the left and the right, and then finally it fell over, circled round and came to a standstill. And then he took the wheel that had taken six months to make and he rolled that one down the street. As that ran out of energy, it didn't wobble to the left or the right and it didn't fall over. It stopped still, perfectly balanced in the street, in the words of the Sutta, as if it was attached to an axle. He said, now, these two wheels may look the same, but they're not the same. One of them is balanced and one of them isn't. So the Buddha said, this was the Buddha's own story. You know, all great spiritual teachers talk in metaphors and analogies and talk about the things that they find around them, right? These are, making wheels was a big deal back in the old days. For you lot, you just buy a Toyota, don't you? But, you know, it was a big deal and it was something that people could relate to back in those days. Even a Toyota, you know, if you don't balance it, do you ever have balance? You know, when you change the tire, they charge you for balancing. Do you know what balancing is? It's not just an extra $20 that they charge you. They spin the wheel very fast because no wheel and tire is perfectly balanced. And as you drive down a motorway at 100 miles an hour, that fine imbalance will rattle your wheel and rattle your steering wheel and sooner or later will break the car. So they spin the wheel very fast and they attach tiny weights to the rim of the wheel to make it perfectly balanced so that your steering wheel doesn't judder. So if your steering wheel judders, you're like, that's my balancing. So the Buddha used this analogy himself and he said that this is the difference between a moral person and an immoral person. They will look the same, but in their heart, one of them can stop still and one of them can't. Stop still, the stopping still of the wheel had two meanings. The first meaning was when you do meditation, if you lived your life in a moral way, in a good way, when you do your meditation, the mind will stop still and not wobble to the left or the right. Wobbling to the left or the right is getting caught up in thinking or getting caught up in drowsiness. It's able to be balanced. Also, the second meaning of the story was, as you get to the end of your life, you will, uh, as you die, if you haven't be trained yourself, and you wobble means that you're going to fall down to a lower realm. If you're stable means that you're able to go to a higher realm. And presumably most of us want to go to a higher realm, uh, or at least no worse than this. Um, so you see here the Buddha was also saying that if you commit yourself to a lifelong practice of stability, you get the benefit not just in your meditation, but also in your whole life. You're a person who may look the same as anybody else, but internally, inside, you're of a greater stability in the mind. Another analogy he gave was uh, a person who is thirsty and looking for a drink, and he's wandering along a path, and he comes across a hoof print, and that hoof print is full of water. How does the man get the water out of the hoof print? Let's just hope that it is water. He must take a piece of straw, kneel down on his knees and very carefully suck the water out from the center of the hoof print without it getting stirred up with mud. He said, this is like an immoral or a bad person who comes to do meditation. If they are very careful and they control their mind, they will be able to get to the meditation, but it will be very small. Be, the benefit from the meditation will be very small. He said, compare that to a man who walks through the desert looking for water and he comes across an oasis and he tears off his clothes and he jumps in and he splashes around. He said, this is a good person who when they do meditation will easily get the benefit and easily find the water. So you can see in these um, kind of teachings, the Buddha was also saying that there is a certain set point, but if you practice through your lifetime with a with a dedicated determination to living your life on a higher level, to giving up the drink and giving up the killing of animals and giving up the hatred, living the life in a simple uh, and an easy way, then the meditation will be a lot more balanced. So this, I think, is the, was the Buddha saying that 
acknowledging that in the meditation, yes, it's going to be a little bit difficult when you get started. You're going to get caught up in thinking, you're going to get caught up in drowsiness. But if you pay attention to the stabilization practices, these practices of loving kindness, forgiveness, of the sympathetic joy mudita, which is the, you know, taking pleasure in other people's joys and successes. If you concentrate on these two, these are not the emptiness practices, but these will stabilize your character. Yeah. So we have this interesting question, does it take a stable ego to go beyond the ego? These are all practices that are designed for stabilization. They're not the emptiness practices. They won't get you enlightened, but they will stabilize you and enable you to stop still. The research in psychology into this, one of the recommendations, if you want to change your set point for happiness, it said write down five things that you appreciate every day. This is a wonderful practice. This is the practice that we're doing at the end of the meditation just now. The appreciation practice of taking some time out to deliberately think and, and pay attention to appreciating the good things that you have. Uh, this is one surefire way to, to start to nudge up your set point and your happiness point. So there are these uh, two kinds of practice to wrap up. The enlightenment, the emptiness practices, which are all about letting go, stopping still, not having any object in the mind, but simply knowing what is awareness and what is not awareness. Then there are the second level of practices, which are the ego stabilization practices, which we should do lifelong. Practicing being generous, practicing being compassionate, improving our levels of forgiveness, improving our levels of equanimity and the other good qualities. So all of that was a roundabout way to say, be good. If I call the talk, be good, you're like, yeah, yeah, we know, we should be good, you know, give me some enlightenment stuff. <laughs> so I call the talk the feed forward loop. By doing these practices, it's feeding forward into your, uh, into your meditation too.